Well, greetings and welcome to a special edition of Dividing Line. We're not live streaming, we're just recording uh, directly. Uh, we've got all sorts of um, connection issues, and the people who are supposed to fix the connection issues are coming, but you know how that works. We will see um, how all that comes together. But furthermore, you may not want to even watch or listen to this program. I'll be honest with you. There's only a certain group of our audience that is going to want to do this one more time. Uh, because what I'm doing today is I haven't talked about this for a while, but while I was uh, overseas um, interacting with Muslims, and uh, of course, uh, I, I will mention every single person that I've spoken to in ministry overseas. So in other words, outside of the nice, cushy, little, soft bubble of the United States, every person I've talked to about the Qadi dialogues, um, our approach to uh, Islam, et cetera, et cetera, has been, how else do you do it? Yeah, sure. Yeah, we're, we're with you 100%. It's only the people who live in these in the nice, little, cushy, we don't really have to deal with Muslims, don't even have to. And in fact, in speaking with Muslims, one of the things that's been extremely, well, it, it, it should be obvious, but when you explain to Muslims what is being said by people like Steve Camp and Brandon House and Janet Mefford and stuff like that, they just look at you like, so those people think we have leprosy. Is that the idea? Uh, the, these, they say they love us, but they're treating us like we're all hiding an AK-47 behind our back and we're just a bunch of blithering liars and none of us actually believe what we say we believe and and they get to say what we actually believe and you know it's really disrespectful yeah yeah i yeah i know so they they expect us to listen to them talking about jesus being the truth even though they don't actually live truthfully uh yeah uh, yeah mm, yeah no, no, got it <sighs> um so yeah uh, black eye but, but again most of these critics uh and i'm gonna be responding to steve camp today he was on the bible thumping wingnut um, I started listening to it and I said, I, I, there's some, there's some new stuff here. There's some stuff that hasn't been said before. There's some, there's some evolution in the argumentation and I need to respond to it. But when you're talking about people like Steve Camp, you know, it's funny in this interview, when it got to the point of, uh, critiquing what I was doing in the mosque, Steve couldn't give us anything he's ever done with Islam because he's never done anything with Islam. Um, he had to go back to his one story about getting beat up by AIDS activists. Uh, that's, that's just, that's all he had because, and one of the things I'm going to respond to, he grossly misrepresents me and the claims that I make in regards to Islam, but there's, there's, we're going to point out just a couple of major, uh, massive holes in Mr. Camp's understanding of, uh, of Islam and his perspectives, but the point is, of course, in all of this, that we want to provide a foundation of encouraging believers around the world to engage Muslim people in a way that will adorn the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it's interesting, if, if Steve had a response, if Mr. Camp... I, you know, I'm, I'm going to refer to him as Mr. Camp. Um, he constantly refers to me as Jim. Um, he knows that's offensive to me. So a little backstory there. He knows that's offensive to me. So that's why he keeps doing it. <laughs> there's a, there's constant jabbing, uh, while saying, oh, I love him. Great. Oh, he's done such great stuff. Uh, in between stabs. Um, uh, Mr. Camp, um, Mr. Camp is, is if he had any kind of meaningful exegetical response to offer to what I have written on specifically just, just two words, the verbal form of pytho, but if you want to use the substantival form, uh, pismene is the substantival form related to the verbal form pytho. And dialogismos, from which we get dialogue, uh, reasoning, argumentation. Uh, if Steve had any kind 
of an exegetical response to what I've written about that, we would be hearing about it constantly. He has none. And he knows that. He's well aware of it. Even though he'll tweet things out, I've not, they haven't given a sing, they haven't given any biblical basis for this IFD thing. And of course, we all know that what you do is you take IFD, interfaith dialogue, and you just don't deal with it truthfully. Because any debate is an IFD. Any witnessing situation is an IFD. Um, while I was in London, I had numerous IFDs in Uber cars. <laughs> the first three drivers I had were Muslims, and we had IFD. So you can take that phrase, and of course, historically, it, over the past you know, 30 years, Interfaith dialogue has simply been used to refer primarily to ecumenical, ishy squishy, compromising uh, people on one side who don't really believe anything, talking with people on the other side who don't really believe anything, resulting in a black hole of not believing in anything. Um, which, of course, is exactly what we said we were not doing. So what you do is you just you just throw it all together, and then you can just use the term in a negative fashion. Even though, to be truthful, you'd have to differentiate what, what are we talking about here? Are we talking about someone who is having dialogue between differing faiths, but is doing so for the right purposes, for the purposes of opening doors of further communication? And the reason I did it, which I was wide open with, which my alleged Christian brothers just ignore, just won't even deal with, and that is opening doors to the gospel because I believe the gospel is what saves. I don't think I have to, I don't think I have to hide it. I don't think I have to give it safe spaces. And I also don't think that I have to give a four spiritual laws. This is your list. If you don't hit every one of these points, you actually didn't do the gospel thing. Because we're going to hear this over and over again. Steve's going to say over and over again, yeah, well, he didn't say this, and he didn't say that, and he didn't say this, and he didn't say that. Now, the host actually caught him on this a couple of times. He said, well, look, if I wanted to be really specific, you didn't mention this, you didn't mention that, uh, you didn't go in enough depth on this, didn't go enough, I mean, we could, you, can, you can get super picky on anybody. I mean, if you look at the book of Romans, there are things that Paul said in Galatians didn't say in Romans. So I guess Paul blew it. Because, I mean, are you saying what's in Galatians isn't important? See how easy that is? That's simplistic. But I'm going to give you a clear example. And we're going to hear this. We're going to hear Steve just face planting in this over and over again when he says, there is no repentance, there is no repentance, there is no repentance. Did you know something? There are entire books of the Bible that do not contain the word repentance. Did you know that? Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, one of them's called, um, um, oh yeah, the Gospel of John. Hmm. Well, you you want to you want to you want to confirm that? Well, everybody today, uh, just in, in fact, you know, you, I'm, I'm going to check this. Um, I'm going to check this to see if you can do it without using a Greek root right live here on the air. Uh, Put, just put in repent with a star so you can come up with all of the relevant stuff. And, oh, there's, boy, there's lots of stuff in, in, uh, in Matthew and Mark and Luke. Uh, Luke 24, 47, that repentance or remission of sin should be preached as name among all nations be in Jerusalem. The next, the next entrance, Acts 2, 38. From Luke to, 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 to Acts. Now, you, you, if you want to use meta and then put a new after it, meta, well, new Omicron, Yoda probably would be pair of things down. If you want to check on the root, go that direction. Cool. Um, isn't that called the uh, gospel according to John? But it doesn't have. How does that work? It works because Steve's artificial you must tick off my little box things, doesn't work with the New Testament itself. That's why it works. Because you see, John doesn't expect you to just look at his letter in isolation from everything else. 
any more than you should look at the single dialogue I have with Yasser Qadi in isolation from everything else I've done with Islam. And that's exactly what Steve Camp does, and he knows it. And he knows it. It's dishonest. It's inaccurate. It's untruthful. But that's what he's doing. And that's what Brand House and Janet Mefford and all the others have been doing as well. Just isolate it. Don't worry about that debate in the mosque where you talked about all that stuff and union with Christ and imputed righteousness and stuff like that. Ah, no, 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 don't worry about that. Don't worry about the hundreds of hours of programs you've done where you've gone through all of this and you, you, go, you play Muslim uh, videos and go through them and listen to them and accurately interact with, ah, ignore all that. Don't worry, no, we can't worry about that. Well, then you better throw John out. I guess John's not really gospel, uh, at least according to Pastor Camp. Um, so we're going to hear that over and over and over again. I thought I'd just run that search for you right while we were doing that, just so you could see how that works. All right, let's jump into what was said on the program. And uh, <laughs> I guess I shouldn't play it at 1.8 because, man, I, I get enough complaints at 1.2. Uh, but 1.8 allows you to mark things a lot faster. So let's uh, not gonna play the whole thing. I, I, I did. I just put together enough stuff that we would be able uh, to, you know, just just expose what uh, what Pastor Camp's doing. Because well, let me let me actually show you something. Um, there is a. I, I, I even hate to to show this guy's tweet on the program because he, he lives for this. But there's, there's a, there is, I call him the world's greatest internet troll. He is the most despicable man I know on the internet, period. And I cannot even say on the air the things he's said in the past that verify and demonstrate that the man is utterly despicable. But he is, I have, I have this much respect. I, I have respect for a lot of people. I have no respect for this man at all, none whatsoever. He is vile and just discussing on a level is difficult to even begin to conceive. And uh, he calls himself Dr. James Ock. He, uh, I think he's a teenager that lives in his mom's, well, probably not a teenager. He's probably in his early 30s living in his mom's basement still. But anyways, you can tell I have, I have no respect for the man at all. And again, I have reason for this. I really do. People from about five or six years ago know exactly why, uh, but I'm not going to go back through all that and uh, give him the pleasure of having his vileness re-presented re to the world. Anyway, um, this man is a stalker. He is imbalanced. He is absolutely, I mean, all I got to do is follow his feed. And, oh, by the way, I'm actually uh, partially responsible for the suffering due to Hurricane Harvey. My cult. <laughs> I can't. Can't make this stuff up, folks. I really, really can't. But anyway, um, he put up this uh, this tweet, and uh, if we could uh, show it here, it's uh, it's comical. James White's cult wants to know about Islam when they don't even when they don't even what the Bible says or which Bible says it about Christianity. Now, what you need to understand is what is behind this. Um, is the fact that this person, whoever he is, is a King James onlyist. And so part of the issue uh, is what he's saying there is a, is a King James only statement. And so you'll notice if you look look down here right there, there's one like, believe me, this guy <laughs> this guy would his day would be made if he could get into double digits. <laughs> um, but uh, there's one like, and it's uh, and it's Steve Camp. Yeah, right there. Um, Steve Camp. So I, I pointed this out and uh, put on Twitter a, a new low even for Camp. Uh, Steve Camp's response was, uh, well, I just I was just doing that to get a rise out of you. Just, just, just calm down, you know. And it's like, yeah, sure. Don't believe you as far as I can throw you. Nope, sorry. You you liked it because you liked what it said. That was obvious. And so a little bit after that, uh, we we got this. And uh, I don't know if uh, that changes things because it's smaller or anything. But uh, uh, 
Pastor S.J. Camp, J.W. is widely known for how he mistreats people over many years. Now, I refuse. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be dealing with what he actually says and refuting it factually. I refuse to start getting into this kind of a uh, blaming. If, if I wanted to go nuclear on Steve Camp and stuff that I know, I could do it. Won't do it. He knows that. He knows that I will not take that, that, that road, even though he knows I probably know the things he knows I know. Figure that one out. Um, <laughs> but I know stuff, and he knows I know stuff, and he knows I know the people who know stuff. Um, not going to go there. Um, but we've heard, we heard that accusation before. In other words, he disagrees with William Lane Craig. It's, just, uh, it's, it's responsive. Okay, whatever. All right, so let's keep that in mind as we uh, listen to uh, the Bible-thumping wingnut broadcast. And uh, uh, what was said? I, I think this aired what last week? I think uh, maybe maybe even this week. Uh, I don't I don't know. I, I just saw the part two thing come up, so it may have aired just a few days ago. Is when it came out. So let's dive in. Yeah, and and I think here's the here's the double edged sword on that, Tim. And I I appreciate the question. I uh, I don't look at it as so much a calling out, just a good, honest, uh, straightforward question. So thank you for it. Uh, the reason I challenged uh, John on that uh, was because the title of the video is "What is the Gospel?" Now okay. that's now question he was answering. Stop. Um, here's here's the situation. Before getting to me, uh, Tim, the Bible thing, wing, wing nut, uh, said you went after John Piper, and John Piper, they had put out a "What is the Gospel?" video. And Camp's criticism is the same kind of criticism he uses against me. To answer that question, you can only answer it one way. You cannot ever have a situation where you focus upon anything other than his tick boxes. You got to have this, 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 that's it. There's no place for ever going deeper, having any kind, uh, you know, if you go to a, well, I'm just sitting here looking at the, the, the 2018 G3 thing. G3 is going to be imbalanced. In fact, I was just looking. Justin Peters will be speaking the 2018 G3 conference on discernment and discipleship. Okay. Uh, well, you know, discipleship, that means there's not going to be a focus upon substitutionary atonement. There may not even be one on incarnation. Imbalanced. Can't do that. So you can't have conferences that are focused on discipleship. It just has to be the same thing, the same, simple, don't go deep, just, just do the same thing. And I'm sure that if we went to the Cross Church and listened to all of Steve's sermons, I'm sure every single sermon covers incarnation and resurrection and with equal, with equal I, I bet you it's all the same sermon over and over again, right? Of course not. He's being hypocritical. He doesn't hold himself to these standards. Not at all. Nobody could. Because they're artificial standards. They're not even biblical standards. I mean, Paul actually talked about things in Galatians that he didn't talk about in Ephesians. And where's the emphasis in Philippians on the stuff that you find in sections or Romans? Oh, even Paul can't pass this test. Oh my goodness. So they're going after Piper because Piper puts out a video. Oh, it's just not balanced. It's a, there's nothing about the incarnation. There's nothing about that. And it's like, uh, yeah, okay. This guy's been preaching for how many decades? And you, you know, he's he's done entire things on incarnation and Trinity. And and so if he if he doesn't repeat everything in a simplistic little fashion every single time, then he's just and you just sit there and go. Why? Why? Why aren't you? Why aren't you applying these standards to yourself? Why can't you see how silly this is? But that's what we've got going on here. To answer your question, and and I I have it queued up. It's three and it's three and a half minutes long. I won't play it, but I'll try to remember to link it in the video. And he describes six elements of the gospel as 
One, a plan. Two, an event. Three, an achievement. Four, an offer. Five, the application. And six, God. Which I have no clue why he answered it that way. But you and I know he is solid on the gospel. But on this, oh, pati- absolutely. But on no, this he, particular he video, he didn't share the work of Christ, uh, the atonement. He didn't share repentance. He didn't share the virgin birth. He didn't share a bunch. And every preacher I know, Jonathan Edwards, uh, Stephen Charnock, you name them, they will have entire sermons that are not balanced. Because there are times, you know, if you want to go in depth on the incarnation, you ain't going to have time for all sorts of other things. It's okay. You, you look at the entirety of a person's presentation. Bodily resurrection. Well, and I, I think that's the issue. Uh, I think you've put your finger on the issue. When someone is answering a question, and by the way, this is a produced video through the Gospel Coalition. 2008. That, 2008. 2000, yeah, 2008. And, uh, and he was asked a question. They brought him in specifically on a series of questions. What is the Gospel? That is how uh, he chose to answer it. But there's, there's a few basics, and you've really mentioned them. The two things that separate Christianity from all other religions is atonement and resurrection. And under the, those two things, everything else functions. You know, it's interesting. Well, why not repentance? Why not? Th- well, well I, I was just talking about the two things that separate from... See, you get to define those things, but nobody else does. Hmm. The incarnation of Christ, that he pre-existed in eternity past and came to this earth, lived the sinless life that the first Adam could not live, satisfied the law and the penalty of the law. Now, by the way, later on, he's going to criticize me. Uh, there is a period in the mosque where Yasser Qadi said to me, most Muslims don't understand what you're saying here. Well, I actually disagree with Yasser Qadi about that because in conversations with people afterwards, they did understand. And sometimes people tend to, you know, underestimate exactly how, what, what people understand. But it's funny. Uh, Steve just loves the fact that, that Yasser Qadi had to correct me because I, I'm so arrogantly claiming to be the guy in Islam, which I've never claimed. Um, but uh, the funny thing is whenever Steve then forgets about that criticism and he starts uh, doing his, later on he's going to do, I, I, in 60 seconds I can give you the whole gospel. You know what he did? Even more Christianese buzzwords than I used. <laughs> my, my explanation of justification was so much clearer than anything Steve Camp gave, uh, specifically for Muslims. Steve Camp doesn't understand Islam, so he wouldn't know that, but still, it was so much clearer. And yet, on the one hand, well, I, those Muslims would never understand what you were just saying. And then when he shows how he can do it in 60 seconds, he uses every Christian buzzword on the planet, uh, which would be even less understandable. But again, when you're not out there doing the interaction, you know, it's so easy from the easy chair uh, to make, you know, to do the kind of criticism that, you know, Brandon House isn't out there. He's not out there. It's it's real easy to sit in the bleachers and go, I gotta know what he's doing, and and so on and so forth. That every sin by every believer that was ever to be, that every sin by every person that was to ever believe was placed on Christ on the cross. The guilt, the penalty, and the very wrath of God that burns against our sin, that eternal wrath was compressed in the time. Jesus took it. He drank the cup. It wasn't the cup of dying. It was the cup of the wrath of the Father, still in communion with the Father upon the cross, but he drained that cup to the very dregs and then died, rose bodily from the grave, as Romans 4.25 says, for our justification, ascended into the heavens, reigns and rules from the right hand of the throne of God, and grants us the faith and the grace to believe. Now, if you notice... All this sounds wonderful because you and I have sat under ministers who have gone in depth on each one of these points so we understand them and we understand their relationship with one another. If you can never go in depth and hence be imbalanced in a sermon, if you can't go, ever go in depth, none of this is going to make any sense to you at all. At all. It gives us the Holy Spirit in regeneration so that we can confess him as Lord and Savior of our lives and believe in our heart that God has raised him from the dead. Salvation is all of grace, all of Christ, all of the Holy Spirit, all of the Father, and we are the wonderful recipients of that grace, God's righteousness at Christ's expense. So I'm wanting to know when Dr. Piper, and he's brilliant, and he's passionate, and he's spoken to my own heart in life, why is it when he's asked a question on the gospel, why not just say it? 
How many times has John Piper said it with more eloquence and depth than Steve Camp just did? Many, many times. So, oh, maybe he was at a, at a conference where there was a spe specific focus upon something, and so he used that focus or something. I don't know, but are we really going to buy the idea that every single time you hear Steve Camp talk about the gospel, he does it in the exact same words? So if he emphasizes anything more than another time, is that somehow dishonest, unbiblical, incomplete? Why not say it? Why not talk about who Christ is and what he did? And you can get it in in two minutes. That's, that's a concern to me. So when I say on Twitter, you know, I paid him a compliment and said, but how could he miss it on this question so widely? And, and the six points, they didn't even alliterate themselves. At least that would have been entertaining if everyone started with a B or a, a K or whatever it may have been. Um, he got a couple of them, achievement and whatever. I, I just think that why is it that when men are asked a direct question, why not be plain? We're dealing with people's lives for eternity. And why stutter on that? Why be clever on that? Uh, why not? Just now, see, you know, one of the points we're going to we're going to bring up a little bit later on is Steve seems to feel that plain and baseball bat are the same thing. Doesn't seem to recognize that there are times, there are situations where you actually, I'm going to sound a little charismatic here for a second. You have to actually allow the Holy Spirit to lead you into how you respond to questions. I've given these examples before, but... There is a situation I remember very clearly it, when people say, have you ever experienced supernatural in your life? Yeah, yeah I have. Um, stand outside the north gate of the temple in Salt Lake City. This guy comes walking out, comes straight up to me, wants to, wants to talk, wants to tract. And you have to make a decision. What am I going to be talking about? And normally you do what the tract says. You, you have an idea. You're going to be talking about such and such each day. You have a certain direction you're going. I had a supernatural impression to completely change my approach in talking to this individual. And in fact, I went for a subject that I don't like talking about. It's not one of my strengths. It was the one subject that got his attention, that he wanted to talk about. It, was, it wasn't my strength, not something I normally did. It was a supernatural situation. And it was a topic that was not in of itself specifically gospel-centric. From this perspective, shouldn't do it. Never a time to follow the Spirit's lead. Never a time to focus upon something that might open up doors because you see, the gospel presentation is a one-time thing. You got to get it all in one shot. You can't build relationships. You can't hope for, for years. And if I'm sitting at a gate, um, taking a flight, maybe. But the fact is, most Christians around the world recognize that the way to really do it is to build relationships and plow the ground. And so when you plant that seed, you're not just tossing it upon a rock. That's what I see Steve telling us to do. Toss your seed upon a rock. Don't, don't do anything else. No preparation, no nothing. It's the non-apologetic apologetic, the non-engagement. Just throw it out there and there you go. Um, no, there, there have been situations where I've recognized that you need to go this direction and we have to be able to follow the Spirit's leading in that point and to recognize that, let's say you only, you know, are you really telling people that when they only get a portion of God's truth communicated that they, they were not being faithful? They failed? No, no. I reject it. I reject it. All right, a little bit later on. But I believe this, what he's ventured in now with Islam. Okay, now, now we've gone to me, okay? Now, now, he's, now he's starting to talk about me.
But I believe this, what he's ventured in now with Islam and Dr. Qadi, especially who he calls his greatest influence in Islam and his mentor in the Islamic faith. Um, that's a concern as an evangelical. Um, um, again, why? Um, why? Uh, I mean, I understand for people who are ignorant of Islam, where, where you're, you're, you're satisfied with uh, a surface-level, secondary source knowledge of primarily political origination, Fox News level. I understand why, why you would have a problem with that. But why would anyone seriously have a problem with learning from a scholar of another faith? What, what, what is, again, I've never had anyone explain this outside of just expressing gross bigotry, bias, prejudice. I just don't like Muslims. Uh, why would an evangelical have a problem with a Christian scholar learning from a Muslim scholar so that you have accurate knowledge? Now, now Steve does not think that having accurate knowledge of Islam matters. In fact, he tweeted, um, let me, let me see if I can find it here. Uh, it was just, just this morning, actually. Um, yeah, this was just one hour ago. Lie. The more you know about Islam, the more people you'll reach with the gospel in Islam. Truth. When you proclaim the whole gospel, truth, God changes lives. That is a simplistic, childish, and false dichotomy. Because the truth is that God can use any person to proclaim his gospel to a Muslim. Anybody. But if you're going to go plant churches in Utah, you better know Mormonism. If you're going to go to a Middle Eastern country, you need to know how to communicate to Muslims. That's just simplicity. That, that's just such basic. You, you just have to be so stuck. Absolutely stuck. In your comfortable little bunker in the United States to not realize that there are barriers to the presentation of the gospel and that you want to be a sharp instrument in the hand of Christ. That's why we train our missionaries to be able to communicate with people in foreign countries, not just linguistically, but to understand their religious faith. If Steve Camp was in charge of, of seminary education, we wouldn't do that. We wouldn't do that. You just send them in there, and they'll just give you a good old American, make America great again gospel. Ah! Well, congratulations. Um, that's not going to, that's not going to, not going to do it. And, and we're not going to, we're not going to, we're not going to go there. So anyway, then we, uh, we press on here. Uh, when I when I point to a debate, it's not all bad, but when I point to a debate and I look for those things, and and I hope people realize when I mention this, it means I've watched that two and a half hour debate. I've done my homework. I've invested my time. So Steve claims he's done his homework. So when he misrepresents and demonstrates such utter disregard for my own statements, then he is fully accountable. He says it right there. I've done my homework. I'm not ignorant of these things. I know they said this is not a kumbaya moment. I know they said they're not sweeping anything. But, but I'm going to say they were anyways. And, I, you know, it doesn't matter, you know, the stuff that goes against my position that was in the—I in the, just ignore all that. He, he said it. He, he put it, put it out there, right there. When I listened to James White dialogue, interfaith dialogue, I looked at each of those— three times and then his subsequent radio webcast uh, shows and different things um by the way the the ding this time isn't me <laughs> that's that's the messenger i know what that is now that's that's an apple messenger thing and i think uh, mr camp was on um a mac and people were messaging <laughs> 
messaging him. Because when I was first listening to it, I'm, I'm looking around going, is that my phone? What, what is that? And then I realized, no, it's actually just uh, somebody else's. It was recorded and they were probably using Skype and that's where it came from. So so again, there I, I listened to it three times. So he is fully accountable for all the misrepresentations where, where he ignores stuff. When I can play, you know, people have produced entire videos where they just went back through the conversation and just let the video refute everything that Steve and Janet and Brandon and everybody else was saying. Love videos. They're, they they work really well that way. You know, so I tried to invest my time, and I hope that's a sign of my care for the issue and the respect for I have for any of these men. Now, remember, the respect I have for these men. Let's. I have seen no repentance on Steve Camp's part for his identification of me as a coward, insane, um, he has not withdrawn the lengthy diatribe that he posted back in July, which I completely shredded, just tore it to shreds, biblically, logically, uh, docu on a documented basis, left no point unrefuted. He just keeps repeating it. No point unrefuted. He stands absolutely refuted, but he will not accept it. He will not accept it. Um, but, but he greatly respects me. Though I'm a coward and insane, a compromiser, a useful idiot. I'm sorry. I, you know, when I say that someone's a brother and I respect them, it, it, there's, I don't know, there's stuff that goes together with that that doesn't include calling people insane and cowards and stuff like that. I, I don't know. Man, I'm just, I could just be weird. But it's the same concern I have here. If you're in a mosque and you have an imam, uh, that is not just an ordinary imam. This is a friend of Linda Sarsour who declared a jihad against Trump and the American government. <laughs> you know, I mentioned before, I, I actually asked Dr. Cotty, I said, you know, getting a lot of questions about uh, the things you said about Linda Sarsour. Because we see a fundamental contradiction between uh, your expressed perspectives on human sexuality and things like that, even though he's changed on some of those things. Um, but we see fundamental differences between her and you. Um, and he says, oh, I've, I've, I've expressed my disagreements with her on many, many issues. But the fact of the matter is she's being attacked by the very same people who attack me. This is a clear instance of when, when you're in a minority, and you view the majority as attacking your minority, that creates cohesion within the minority that, this, this word used to have different meaning, trumps uh, the distinctions and divisions that would normally exist amongst you. It's well known, whenever you have a group that's in the majority, the distinctions between their perspectives can be emphasized when they become a minority, those distinctions often become compressed because the space in which they have to exist has become smaller. And so I theorized, and then he confirmed for me, basically, um, oh, we have many theological disagreements and I would disagree with her on many points and she knows that. But the very same people who lie about me are attacking her and therefore. Do I find that Overly consistent? No. No, I don't. Why does anybody think that I'm supposed to somehow defend every position the Yasser takes because we never said that we agreed with one another by any stretch of the imagination? Um, but when he says he's not a normal imam, um, he's quite mainstream, actually. He's quite mainstream, uh, which only shows that Steve Camp doesn't know what a normal imam is. Uh, I mean, uh, well, yeah, Muslim brother is not... 95% uh, of the imams in North America go to ISNA or have some association with ISNA. It's the biggest organization there is. That's why you can connect everybody that way. It's real easy. You know, it's like, oh, he's a Southern Baptist. He went to the Southern Baptist Convention once, you know. Constitution a few weeks ago, uh, he was with the head of care and, uh, and with Linda Sarsour. This is a man who has taught Sharia law for many, many years. Um, yeah, I think I said that. Um, and, uh, you know, I talked about his lectures on Hadith and of course, the Hadith sciences are the foundation of Sharia. I really wonder how many books, um, 
Steve has read on Sharia. Uh, I, I really do. I mean, I've a lot of the books I've read on, Sh on Sharia have not been all that exciting, but but I read them so that I would understand, you know, the various schools of jurisprudence and the, the historical development and stuff like that over time, and where they differ, where they have similarities. Uh, and you have to understand something in the 1400 year existence of Islam. It's never referred to itself as a religion. Does not exist. Uh, when I heard that, first of all, I could not, I, I, I couldn't see the connection. I still can't really see the connection. I mean, he, he's, he's, he goes on to talk about Sharia. Um, but I, I just, I just sat there going, how, how do you respond to something like that? Because any Muslim listening to that is just going, <clears throat> really? And so I, I went on Twitter uh, and, and I, I know that he hasn't blocked me. He's blocked almost everybody else, but he hasn't blocked me. And I said, so, so Steve, uh, do, do you stand by that statement? Do, could, could you explain what you meant by that? Do you, do you stand by the statement that Islam never identifies itself in 1400 years and never identifies itself as religion? Because if you've watched this program, there are a number of times we've played um, segments from alleged former Christians that have appeared on what, what program? It's called The Dean Show. But it's spelled D-E-E-N. It's not that, you know, the host isn't named Dean, D-E-A-N, like Dean Martin. Um, so why is it called the Dean Show? Because Dean means uh, religion. And Dean, in its various forms, as an Arabic word, appears over 100 times in the text of the Quran. And it's not like this should be a revelation to anyone. Because I bet, sadly, I bet if if Steve was just, you, know, you just caught him out where he, you know, you took his cell phone from so he couldn't Google anything. And you said, Steve, give me a verse from the Quran. It'd be nice if it was some of those verses that are actually relevant to witnessing situations. Um, does Steve know what Surah 4, 171 is about? How about Surah 4, 157? That one's really important. Uh, how about which portion of the Quran has as its background the encounter between the Christians from Najran and Muhammad toward the end of his life? Because it's really important in regards to Islam's view of Jesus and things like that. What, which part of the Quran is that about? Um, where is the section that gives us the only place where the three... Are mentioned. Say not three. Um, what what's the only verse that gives us three in the Quran? I don't think Steve knows, but I have a sneaking hunch that the one ayah um, that he probably would know because it's repeated all the time in the circles in which he travels is. Surah 929. Surah 929. Isn't, isn't this the one? Fight those who do not believe in Allah in the last day and who do not consider unlawful what Allah and his messenger have made unlawful. Oh. And then it says, and who do not adopt the religion of truth from those who were given the scripture. Fight until they give the jizya willingly while they are humbled. Oh. Oh. Religion of Dean, that's that's Islam. So the the one verse he probably would know is actually where the Quran identifies Islam as a Dean, which is religion. So I I didn't force him to say these words, but um, and you have to understand something in the fourteen hundred year existence of Islam, it's never referred to itself as a religion. It does not exist. Yeah, except for a hundred times in the Quran, <laughs> and probably a thousand times in the Hadith. That, that, there, there you go. I, I tried to get him to explain that. 
Uh, and uh, even though he's been active on Twitter since I tweeted him, uh, and even I even asked other people, because later on he's going to make the accusation that Yasser Qadi has led acts of jihad. And so I was like, hey, could you document that? Uh, Yasser Qadi is an American citizen. You are accusing him of illegal actions. Maybe you could you know, document that in some meaningful fashion, but he hasn't, uh, he hasn't responded. So, uh, we can't, we can't give you his, I would have given you what he said. The fact of the matter is just wrong. He just doesn't know what he's talking about. And that, that's all there's to it. But he would be, I believe, shocked at the cozying up that we're seeing by, in this case, uh, Dr. White, all right. Jim, so with, imams and with the muslim community that's yeah. a concern okay so cozying up cozying up um people who want to see hatred exist between muslims and christians will consider any sign of respect remember brandon house in that first program as soon as i got back from europe remember that first program right toward the end of the first hour they were playing my introduction which which uh, Tim played here, um, played my introduction. He actually is going to play here in a second. Um, where I said, in introducing Yasser Qadi, said nice things about Yasser Qadi. Oh, do you remember? He could not control himself. You can't, there, there is no Muslim worthy of saying anything there, there's no Muslim worthy of, of a compliment, of being respected, nothing. From their perspective, these people are filled with animosity, filled with animosity. It's just, it's just unbelievable. So they consider that cozying up. I consider it opening the door for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, who's going to listen? to a presentation on the deity of Christ. Is Yasser Qadi going to listen to a presentation on the deity of Christ from Steve Camp or from me? Because, for example, uh, I posted, I reposted, someone reminded me of a video that I did, what, uh, two and a half years ago? Where I actually responded to comments that Yasser Qadi made in the Memphis Islamic Center about the Council of Nicaea and the Canon of Scripture. I corrected him. What I didn't mention in the video, because it happened afterwards, obviously, is I sent him the link. And now if, if I approached him the way that Pastor Camp would approach him, do you think he'd even watch it? Nope. Because I've approached him from a position of learning and uncompromising statement from my own side. He listened to me and he said, whoops, thanks. Didn't know. I'll, I'll make the correction. You know, that sort of it just seems like common sense, but common sense gets lost among some people for some reason. Um, Interfaith dialogue. And, you know, the, we're going to we're going to disagree on some of this, but I, I think it's important to point out and it, it's not pragmatic. It, it I'm, I don't justify what Dr. White did, but I think it, it's clear. We need to make it clear. At least I I'm convinced and I think you are, too, that Dr. It, again, it doesn't justify what he did, but his intentions are to win Muslims to Christ. That's his intention. Do, do you agree? I don't agree with that. I don't agree with that. I don't agree with that. It's my stated statement. Any person who's watched, you know, I've lost track. We're getting close to 50 debates now with Muslims around the world. Pretty close because we had two on this last trip. Um, you know, the funny thing, you know, the sad thing in is here. Christians overseas fully understand my motivations. Muslims overseas and in the United States fully understand my motivations. 
Who doesn't get it? These guys. Why? Um, prejudice? Bias? Something? Yeah. Yeah, the Muslims get it. The Muslims understand it. Steve Camp can't. Well, it's not can't. Won't. He could. Would have only a few years ago. Now? No. No. Now it won't happen. Um, sad. Very, very sad. I press forward. If we do what we... If we do... Okay. Now, let me, I, I just want... that They played once again, which is nice. My opening statement. Let me just emphasize a couple of things from it. If we do what we, if we do what I hope happens this evening, we're going to do something absolutely unique. It hardly ever happens. And that is two communities where unfortunately there is a lot of fear on both sides. Okay. Is that true? Steve Camp wouldn't know because he doesn't interact with communities. I do. And it's true. There's a lot of fear on both sides. Um, perfect love casts out fear. That's a biblical statement, I think. Um, if you're fearful of the Muslim people, do you truly love them? Can your love for them survive the fear you have that may be politically based, something like that? See, I made the specific statement. There is a lot of fear. There's fear from the Muslims. They feel in, they're in the South. They've got people driving by them, telling them to go back where they came from. Things like that. There's, there's a lot of fear, which means there's not open dialogue and communication that is the fertile ground for the gospel. And what I want to see happen is I want to see that change. I want to see that change. There is a lot of misunderstanding. Yeah, we just documented that on Steve Camp's part. <laughs> Never called itself religion, except for over a hundred times in the Quran and anyways, how many thousands of times in the city. On both sides. And as a Christian, I want to see doors opened. As a Christian, I want you, as if you are a Christian here this evening, to not have fear of the Muslim people, but to have love for the Muslim people. Oh, how terrible. <laughs> and, 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 and Pastor Camp will say he, he loves the Muslim people, but not enough to accurately represent them. Not enough to actually recognize that we do actually have commonalities. <gasps> He's going to say later on, I don't know what I know. Uh, monotheism, uh, divine revelation, um, law, uh, eternal punishment. Uh, that, that, you can't deny those things. The only way to discuss the differences is to recognize where the agreements are so you can see what the disagreements are. If you say, we disagree about everything, you might as well say the sky is green. It doesn't make any sense. This, these, are, these can only be the words of people who are living in a fantasy world where they never interact with this other side. I mean, you can't live like this and actually sit across the table and talk to a Muslim. It's impossible. They're not doing it, clearly. Uh, yeah. I want the Muslim people to understand that we care and that we want to have dialogue and that we're not seeking this evening to sweep our differences under the rug and say they don't matter. Hmm, and, and, and don't know how many. How, how often, how much clearer would, did I need to be? Dr. Qadi cannot present an Islam that is just simply one view amongst many. I believe in divine revelation. He believes in divine revelation. Uh-oh, that's one of those things where, another thing where we actually have a commonality, which means then we can discuss the differences in our understanding of divine revelation. But if you're not willing to recognize that we both believe in divine revelation, that makes us different than a bunch of other people. If you don't recognize that, then you, you can never discuss what we've discussed in this program over and over and over again, and that is the difference between the Islamic understanding of divine revelation as a tablet in heaven, transcribed, in essence, into the angel Gabriel and then down to Muhammad, sort of like an MP3 transmission thing. That's different than what we understand. Men spoke from God as they're carried along by the Holy Spirit. And this is vitally important to be able to discuss the objections that Muslims have, which Pastor Camp says, we shouldn't actually have to do that. Don't worry about those things. Don't worry about those things. Well, I do because I actually want to reach those Muslims. And it really makes me wonder, well, I'll just leave it there.
So how do we get along? How do our communities talk to one another? How do our communities talk to one another? Evidently, we're not supposed to. No, we can't have, no, 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 no. Just see, you're just, you're just like them liberals. You just want to just get along. Well, the first time I debated a Muslim as a Muslim debate, 2006, Biola University, the moderator of the debate said something I'll never forget at the beginning of the debate, because it was really true. He said, if you can't, if two communities who have fundamental disagreements are not allowed to argue, then all they can do is fight. He meant fight in a negative, violent sense. He was saying what we're doing here is a good thing. He was right. He was right. And I submit to you that the non-interaction, non-showing respect, non doing firsthand study perspective of Pastor Camp and his ilk produces not only ill feelings, but fundamentally undercuts the work of the gospel amongst the Muslims. That's the accusation I'm making. And I stand by it. I stand by it. I'll defend it. And Pastor Camp cannot refute it. The sad fact of the matter is that conversation isn't happening. And I want it to start tonight. It isn't happening. It ain't happening with Steve Camp, is it? Show me where it's happening. Give me some names. And I want it to start here. So uh, if, if you're a praying person, pray. Now, I got, oh, they just raked me over the coals for that. Oh, how dare you say that? You're saying they should pray to Allah. If you're a praying person, pray that you'd have understanding this evening. Well, that's a terrible thing to ask people to do. You're suggesting they commit idolatry. Oh. Man, really? So you, you, you would not say to people, if you're a praying person, pray for understanding this evening. So you've never, you've never, in preaching the gospel, said to someone, pray to God to open your heart and mind? Oh, better, better not. That's, I, those, them Puritans did that, but that was different context. It's not them, they're Muslims. <laughs> we will have understanding that as, if you're a Christian, I want you to hear what this man has to say. I want you to understand why he believes the things he does, what his life is like here in the United States as a Muslim. And I want you to hear, especially when he talks about what Islam is and what it is not and who speaks for Islam and all these types of things. I want you to hear so that we can have better communication with one another. That's why we're here this evening. Uh, I hope that's why you've come here this evening. Better communication with one another. Why do you think I want that to happen? I've told the stories about what happened after Right? Well, well, Steve's never mentioned that. No, no. He says he's listened to the programs of done, but he's never mentioned, you know, like that conversation about the Council of Nicaea, and the deity of Christ. And things like that. See, that's what I mean by opening doors and having communication. Because I believe that when that happens, what I've got to offer, the Holy Spirit will make to come alive in the hearts of his elect people. And he'll draw on themselves. That's called evangelism. That's called it. So we're doing, we're, yep, that's what you do. That's what, you, that's what I was talking about. And you might say, well, that's not how I interpret it. I don't care how you interpret it. I am the infallible interpreter of my intentions. So, deet, 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 deet. we are almost, well, I, I should probably speed it up. When we uh, go over there to have refreshments, um, the Christians and the Muslims together We'll be able to have conversation, uh, and many of the misunderstandings that separate us right now will be laid aside. There won't be any compromise, because we both believe very firmly in what we believe and what we profess. Now, why would I want misconceptions to be laid aside? Because the vast majority of conversations that take place between Christians and Muslims are wasted because the Christian doesn't understand what the Muslim believes, and the Muslim doesn't understand what the Christian believes, and they're wasting their time. If you can get the misunderstandings out of the way, guess what can happen? You can actually focus upon what matters. That's the whole purpose. Yes. That's, uh, uh, well, uh, there, there you go. There's, there's the reasons. Differences. He sought out Kadi, kindred spirit similarities, as well as what divides us. And I'm still interested to hear what makes us similar. And 
uh, mentioned it. We both believe in divine revelation. We're both monotheists. We believe there is a God who is personal, who has revealed himself, who is going to judge mankind, uh, who created mankind, and that there is an eternal hell, and there's going to be a judgment. There's something called Qadr. I'm not sure if you know what Qadr is, but there is something called Qadr. And so we need to know, if you don't understand that Qadr exists, then you can't differentiate Qadr from the uh, Christian concept of predestination, election, divine sovereignty, and decree. See, there's all sorts of these types of things. If you're, gonna, if you're actually going to enter into this stuff, there's all sorts of things where you have to understand what the similarities are so you can make proper distinctions. 101. Absolutely 101 level stuff here. Um, and, the, the, and what bothered me is that when Dr. White points out the end game of, of the evening, it's right. so that we can better get along and have better communication. How can we together get along? That means that what I want to see happening, Tim, and I really didn't understand your objections, but what I want to see happening is what happened after these dialogues. I'm not talking about get along as in compromise. Neither one of us ever mentioned anything about it. But if you're not getting along in the sense of showing respect for, being a good neighbor to someone else, being concerned about someone else's well-being, how are you ever going to get to the point of actually presenting the gospel to them in a meaningful fashion that they can understand? Not that fulfills your tick box. Well, I told them. So I've fulfilled, I've discharged. I can hold them at arm's distance. I'm, you just stay out there because you're, I don't like you. You're weird. I don't consider that evangelism. If you just put out your little tick boxes, well, I handed them a track. The, the track said everything needed to be said. So there you go. That's it. Um, if you think that's enough, then I, I, I really have to wonder uh, about your understanding of the love of Christ compels us. Compels us. To keep you at arm's length. <laughs> that's, not, that's not what it meant. That's not what it meant. Yeah, we need to be able to get along so that we can have meaningful communication focused upon what's really important. Yeah, that's, that's given, isn't it? Isn't it? Do we really have to argue about this? I, I thought most of this stuff was pretty much self-evident. Um, I thought the most shocking thing he said to the entire audience, if you're a praying person here tonight, pray. Yeah, so there, there, was, there was that objection. I've already addressed that. Of, I call it the Rodney King theology. Can't we all get along? Uh, refreshments, punch and cookies, conversations. Here was the one thing that was missing. Gospel conversations, opening door conversations, relationship conversations. See, there's, 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 there's no ground for any Muslim to accept any kind of idea that Steve Camp wants to have a meaningful relationship because he doesn't. He doesn't. He just wants you to hear what he has to say. Uh, same, same, you know, same thing with Keith Thompson. Just, you just proclaim it, then walk away. That's just, that's how the gospel, that's how the apostles did. No, it's not. That's not how they did it. The, these people, you, you know, those long conversations that Paul had, they were not five minute presentations of a simplistic checkbox gospel. And then he, you're apostate, you are reprobate, go away. I'm going on to somebody else. So shake off the dust of my feet. That's not what happened. No gospel consideration whatsoever. None. So, no gospel consideration whatsoever. That's just a lie. Steve, wake up. Wake up. You show me a single place, aside from the debate with Shabir Ali in the mosque in Erasmia, where more of the gospel, Trinity, deity of Christ, incarnation, justification, etc., etc., has ever been presented in those dialogues in a mosque. You can't. You've never done it. You'll never be invited to because you don't, you don't have enough respect. Just show me. I'd, I'd just like to see. Why aren't you rejoicing in that? that re we really need to start asking the question, what's the real motivations of these folks? What's their real motivations? When you asked me a few minutes ago, do I believe Jim's primary reason for doing these is for the gospel to see Muslims come to Christ? I want to say no. It's for the purpose of getting along, better communication. You hit it on the head. Better communication of what, Pastor Camp? The gospel. Which is what happened. You know, it's funny. There was a, 
it, it's amazing when Christians don't get it and Muslims do. Um, here's a here's a clip. This is gonna be auto don't worry. Here, Here's a clip from from the mosque. Correctly, uh, and I'm giving you the opportunity to spread your teachings here. <laughs> I'm giving you the opportunity to spread your teachings here. He knew what I was doing. He knew why I was there. He wasn't trying to keep me to do, to, from, from doing that. How come he can get it and you don't? I'd like to suggest it's probably political. It's probably political. There's, there's something else going on there. And, and I, I, think it's, I think it's probably political. You, you have a certain understanding there. I, 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 we, can, we can agree to disagree on that because I, I, I'm convinced that Dr. White's goal, and now I'm going to... I'm going to psychoanalyze him, and but this is just my opinion. But I think that he did this the way he did it because he wants to reach more Muslims. He wants he he. This is just my opinion. I could be way off. He'll never admit if I'm right or wrong, or he'll never admit if I'm right. But I think he did this to gain a greater opportunity to do debates with Muslims because I think he did it because he wants them to know, come to Christ. Not, I, I, I flat out reject any idea that he's doing it so that we can get along. I'm, I'm totally convinced, and I, and I think that you're wrong. Well, thank you. Uh, you are right up to the point of saying my motivation is to open doors, if that includes further debates, further dialogues. The point is, I recognize that the American Muslims and Muslims around the world have rarely heard a meaningful presentation of any element of the gospel. Let me let me tell you a story real quick. Sorry, this if this I don't know how long we've been going, but yeah, yeah, whatever. Uh, oh, okay. Let me tell you a story. Um, a couple of months, about three or four months, maybe six months after. The debate with Shabir Ali in Biola in 2006. I was contacted by a campus ministry. This is a number of years ago. This is over a decade ago now. They told me the story of three young Muslim men from overseas that were attending university. As, you know, exchange students type thing, you know. And they had been witnessing to them and they thought they had answered all their questions and they just they just weren't making a commitment. They, they, so not they, they were really objecting to the Christian faith. They just weren't making that commitment. They sort of wondered, you know, what's, what's in the way? And so they got the videotape back then, or maybe a DVD. I don't know, 2006, somewhere around there, probably a DVD, um, of the debate with Shabir Ali. It was on, is the New Testament reliable? And they showed it to these guys. And when they got done watching the debate, the guy said, when can we be baptized? Now, if Pastor Camp is consistent with himself, he would criticize that debate because I don't think the resurrection was ever mentioned, didn't explain the incarnation, because it was on the reliability of the New Testament. So I was dealing with issues of textual reliability, consistency. We we got bogged down a little bit, though it worked out well, in the um, issue of uh, the Synoptic Gospels and Jairus's daughter and the differences between Matthew, Mark, and Luke on that on that subject, things like that. Um, but it, it, you know, if he's consistent, that was just that was just terrible. That was compromised because it was focused upon one particular subject. And they said, when, when can we be baptized? And they're like, well, what, what about the debate changed your mind? Well, our biggest issue was whether, you know, you had told us what the New Testament teaches, but our biggest question was, could the New Testament be trusted? We can, we've now seen that the best, the best Islamic arguments can be answered by the best Christian arguments. So when can we be baptized? That'll never happen for Steve Camp because Steve Camp does not understand the process of presenting a full-orbed Christian presentation and the recognition that sometimes, you know, there's things you got to deal with. There are issues you have to address. 
that are just not part of it. Tick box. I went through that. That's it. I did my I did my thing. So there you go. There you go. Uh, I guess they weren't really saved, uh, you know, because it didn't fit the. Uh... But in the specificness of this interfaith dialogue, he laid out his own words of what the purpose of these evenings were. The first night in a church, the second night in a mosque. And it was for the pragmatics. Listen, any non-believer could come together and do these things. Any non-believer could try to find that which we have similarities in, which divides. And Steve, this was probably your low point. Um, on any rational level, this was just silly. Um, no unbeliever could have said the things that Yasser Qadi and I said to one another, either in the church or in the mosque. I, I can't believe how any rational person would come to that conclusion. I really can't. That that's that's just it's just silly. That, that's I I how how do you even, I don't even know how to respond to it because the fundamental essence of everything that was said was based upon as had been played already our fundamental commitments to the truthfulness of the divine revelation that is contradictory the theological chasm that separates us all those things you can't ignore that i mean you you are you will ignore that even though you said you listened to it three times so it really makes me wonder why the selective hearing when we see christians and especially pastors or in jim's case as an elder of a church an apologist lower the standard to guard the trust of God's infallible, inerrant word under the guise of having peaceful dialogue. Then, if we're no more discerning than that, then we're going to reap what we sow here, Tim, in the next generation, and we're going to see this, I would call it an unholy alliance between Christianity and Islam on methodology that ends up with a stunted, watered-down theology to condone the very message now that we've unfortunately come to embrace. Do you hear that? Uh, I, I, it's difficult for me to even begin to conceive of how the one person, not, not okay, people pick on me about that. When we look at the past 15 years of debates done by, and, and I'm going to have to stick with English speaking people, sorry. English-speaking Christian scholars with Muslims. Who has the most consistent track record in defending the highest view of Scripture? It's interesting. Um, I follow on Facebook a number of Muslim apologists. And there was a fascinating conversation about two days ago on one of the Facebook walls. Does anyone even use the term wall anymore? It's sort of, that's sort of gone by the wayside, but. Um, and the observation was this, that the majority of Christian apologists dealing with Islam are far more interested in critiquing Muhammad and the Quran than they are talking about the Trinity or defending the scriptures, the consistency of the Old and New Testaments, atonement, resurrection, whole nine yards. And as I thought about it, they named names. I was not listed. And I had to admit, yeah, they're exactly right. The majority of the people they mentioned that, that's their focus. And so I just sort of did this smiling and waving from Phoenix. I made a comment, smiling and waving from Phoenix. One of the commentators responded, by saying, we know you're not like that. And that's why this one said, I, I consider you to be the best Christian apologist. I didn't make that claim for myself. This was a Muslim saying this. Because of the fact that you are a person who not only attempts to be consistent, but you do speak more about your faith and why you believe the things you do than simply attacking Islam. Now, once again, um, here you have Pastor Camp 
accusing me of watering down the gospel, watering down the defense of the word of God. This is a man who will speak boldly, but who is simply not trained or capable of engaging in the level of defense of the scriptures that would be necessary to engage in the kind of work that we do here regularly. He has never published anything that provides any kind of meaningful, unique defense of the inspiration, transmission of Scripture. But he dares to say that someone who has done all that is compromising, all because he will misrepresent what took place in the course of that evening. I don't understand the motivations, um, but I am exposing them and refuting them and have a few more things I need to get to. Um, yeah, there's not too many more things here, just a few more moments. Um, and then we'll, we'll wrap it up because I, I think it's been, we've made our point, but let's just make the point a few more times and hope that we never have to do it again. This is a, a noted antichrist jihadist who represents the largest religion on the planet that is the most blasphemous, pointed uh, representative against the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, that gives us an idea of uh, exactly uh, what Steve Camp's position is. I don't know how he comes to his conclusions. I, I personally think that Mormonism's uh, teaching that Jesus was physically sired by Elohim in a physical body is uh, right up there. <laughs> Um, seems to me pretty obvious that the author of the Quran did not even understand the doctrine of the Trinity. And so, I, you know, I, I mean, that, 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 this is good, nice red meat for folks, but what exactly does it accomplish? And what's this jihadi imam? I'm so sick and tired of the willingness of Christians to lie about Muslims because they're Muslims and to, and to, and to hide the lying under the guise of religiosity. That is absolutely repulsive to me. It's repulsive to me. Yasser Qadi believes in jihad. That makes him a jihadi imam, right? If you can make that connection, recognizing what jihadi imam means to people, recognizing exactly what you're doing with that language, I have no respect for you because you're not a truthful person. And you have no reason to ever ever object to someone misrepresenting you because you're willing to operate on such a horrifically low level of truthfulness. I understand the younger Yasser Qadi's definition of jihad and the current Yasser Qadi's definition of jihad because they're not the same thing. See, I've actually taken the time to listen. I would know what the difference is. And I think Yasser would probably accept my uh, differentiation between the two is correct. I think he'd recognize, yeah, I was in my 20s, late 20s. I was there. Now I've modified that. Uh, you know, he once identified as a Salafi. He doesn't any longer. Okay. I've even listened to people criticize. I've listened to Muslims criticizing Yasser Qadi. Um, but I know exactly why Brandon House, and Steve Camp, and Janet Mefford, Robert Spencer identify him as jihadi. It is pure prejudice. It is nothing but prejudice. It is not meant to open doors, honor truth, uh, open a way for the gospel. It is meant to close doors. It is meant to express animosity. It has no place in a Christian approach. None. None. I know why they're doing it. Any Orthodox Sunni Muslim believes in jihad. Just as any Orthodox Christian believes that someday every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. And as soon as I say that, they go, you can't compare the two things. I'm not saying they're the, the identical things. What I'm saying is 
that there are things that unite all of us together. And Christians believe that someday God is going to bring to a conclusion everything that he has created, which will include the judgment of the wicked. He will extend divine power. Muslims believe the same thing, not in the same way. And if you don't recognize the difference, you'll never get to talk about the distinction and how important it is, which we've talked about in this program over and over again, over and over again. Here, I thought people got what the difference was. Silly, silly me. Now, unfortunately, I accidentally tapped the screen or tapped the uh, thing with Bobby and it moved where the cursor was. <laughs> so let me just play something here. And he said, now, Jim claims to be. Ah, here we go. Uh, I'm not sure if there, where this was, but good enough. We're just going to pick up here. There's only like one, two, three, four, five, six. There's seven little blocks left to do. So we'll, let's get this done. Here's one of the reasons I want to do this program. We've gotten this far in. How long are we in? An hour and 20, approximately. Uh, this is why I wanted to do this program. When I heard this, this is why when I got off the bike because I was riding inside, got off the bike and tweeted about three or four tweets because it angered me. I'll be honest, it, it angered me. Why did it anger me? Um, when Brandon House and his team of hitmen did their programs, I was a useful idiot for Islam because I'm not smart enough to do this. I haven't done enough study. And I dared, they said, he says he's just a student of Islam. Well, we're the experts on Islam, so let's let, we're going to tell you what you need to believe. He's just a student. He's learned stuff from this guy. So the argument was, you shouldn't be talking about this because you don't have the background. We're former Muslims, or at least we grew up in Islamic countries. And so we, we're the experts. And I explained to people, that I use the phrase student of Islam because I recognize it's such a huge topic that starting a study at uh, 44 years of age, approximately, uh, 43 years of age, is too late in life to ever really become an expert on that subject. Now, I know that's, that requires you to have a view of scholarship that isn't overly common today, uh, but it's mine. So I am a student of Islam. There is much that I have yet to learn, and I may never learn. That does not mean that the knowledge that I have is inaccurate. It's just that it's a very deep subject, and there's a lot to know. So when I say that, what I'm saying is I am recognizing the limitations of meaningful scholarship, and I am attempting to point out that People who claim to be experts eh, aren't always experts. And that you should prove your study by the consistency of the argumentation you make and the accuracy of your statements and things like that. We've already caught Steve making a few <clears throat> whoppers. Um, but be it as it may, here's, here's the next statement. And he said, now, Jim claims to be, I think a bit arrogantly, the expert on the Muslim faith, among all any other evangelical. He's the guy. All right? Where have I ever said that? Where have I ever said that? I have never made that statement. Steve, it's a bold-faced lie. You made it up. Whole cloth. What you might be thinking of is a true statement. And that is, in comparison to you, I know a thousand times more about Islam. There's no question about that. I've actually taken the time. I mean, hours and hours and hours and hours. Doesn't make me the expert. There are people who know a lot more about all sorts of areas and aspects of Islam. But I think what's behind that falsehood is a recognition on your part that you are trolling in waters you should not even be dipping your toes in because you have not done the work. You have not read Sahih al-Bukhari. You have not read Sahih Muslim. You don't know the difference 
between sahih, sound and unsound, and the various levels of hadith. You have no earthly idea. You don't know the Quran. You haven't read it as many times as I have. You don't know any Arabic. You don't know the theological terminology. You don't listen to these individuals as they lecture to their own people so that you'd be able to communicate with them. So I think what's going on here is you know that you're criticizing me way out of your depth, and so what you do is you just misrepresent me. It's a falsehood. You know it's a falsehood, and I think you know what you're supposed to do about falsehoods, right? Good. Non-believer explain a devout concept like justification by faith. Okay, then, again, at one point... Yasser Qadi tried to simplify something I was saying about justification. Funny thing is, like I said, we've played, I, I may play it here, I think it comes up here in a moment. When Steve gives his, he's going to give this one minute summary of the gospel, he's going to use every buzzword known to man. But then he turns around here and criticizes me for my explanation, which was much clearer and much more simple in the, in the mosque. So I, 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 I play this just simply for contrast sake. Non-believer explain a devout concept like justification by faith. Jim didn't do it. Yeah. And, and the whole point is, even in that, and I'm not being hyperly critical, just watch the videos. I appreciate what you said to your audience. Yeah, watch the videos. Watch the videos. I didn't explain justification. <laughs> it's, just, it's just like, the, the bias here, uh, there's obviously other things going on with Steve. Uh, on this is not myself and others that are concerned about Jim. The drama in all of this is Jim, why not the gospel? That's the drama. But, but, but Steve, Steve, uh, to, to be honest, you, you first tweeted out saying that he didn't share the gospel. And then when they said, yeah, he did. Now you're like, no, not the whole gospel. And now we're analyzing like the entire scope of everything that we could say about the gospel. Everything, the whole scope of everything we could say about the gospel is way more than two minutes. Bingo. Exactly right. Tim nailed it. Because there was falsehood given forth. You didn't do the gospel. Uh, yeah, we did. Well, you didn't do the gospel with the tick boxes I want to use in the way that I'd like to say it. And look, we could take any sermon that Steve Camp's ever done and critique it. And say, you didn't mention this, didn't mention that, didn't go into enough depth on it, the negative. It's easy to do. Easy to do. Uh, sadly, people do it over Sunday lunches with lots of pastors <laughs> all the time. And I think here's the example. I think here's where Steve tries to say, oh, yes, I can do it. And James could have done it too. Now, listen to all the buzzwords. Yes. Now, I want you to know, Tim, that I, in less than two minutes here, and you've mentioned this as well, can explain Jesus Christ preexisted as God the Son. What does God's Son mean? What does sun mean? In Islamic mind, what does sun mean? Can you tell me, Steve? Can you tell me what the Quran says about sonship? Can you tell me what was going on in the Kaaba before Muhammad? Do you have any earthly idea? None, do you? The most shocking verse in all the scripture, John 1, 14, the word became flesh. Why? He dwelt among us. He had to live the life faithful to the law of God that Adam could never live. And he satisfied the law in his flesh as son of man. Son of man. What's the son of man, son of God? What does, it, what does it mean to fulfill law? Which law? Moses' law? See, th these are questions that Muslims are going to have. You're using all the buzz terms, thinking you're accomplishing something, and you're not communicating anything because you don't know how to do it because your entire apologetics is, we don't need to know. And he satisfied the penalty and everything that the law requires for God to be satisfied. Christ died for God. Satisfied what? Christ died for God. Well, I thought Christ was God. You're not distinguishing between the Father and the Son. You're confusing people, Steve. As Son of God. And our sin, and the guilt and the penalty of our sin, as well as the wrath of God against our sin, was poured out upon Jesus on Calvary's tree. But he didn't die upon Calvary's tree. Surah 4, 1 to 7 says he didn't die. And there's all, just did a whole debate with somebody on that very subject. And he took it. And he satisfied God. What is that? What, satisfied God? He was God. How can God satisfy God? Propitiation. Oh, propitiation. That's a big word. What is that supposed to mean? He was satisfied. His anger assuaged. He died. He rose bodily three days later. In a three days? Uh, Friday to Sunday morning is in three days. ends into the heavens. And salvation, therefore, is putting your faith and belief in the finished work of Jesus Christ upon the cross, whereby 
through the work of the Holy Spirit, you can... The Holy Spirit's angel, uh, Jabril. ...ask him as Lord and believe that God has raised him from the dead to be saved. Now, I don't have a stopwatch, but I think that took about 60 seconds. Yeah, and it wouldn't have really communicated almost anything to a Muslim. It sounded great. But just as you have to define terms for Mormons, just as Mormons think that salvation is of different kinds, and you, salvation is, is resurrection, salvation is, is exaltation, and so you have to be very, very careful, it's so easy when you're not actually out there talking to them, when they're just out there to do that kind of thing. You said, I arrogantly claim something I don't care, I don't, I don't actually claim. That was pretty arrogant, Steve. Well, you didn't <laughs> see uh, now. I think you're proving my point because I could be over and I could I could say, Pastor Steve, you didn't mention the virgin birth, <laughs> you didn't re mention bodily resurrection, or you you gave no call to obey. Which well, here's the thing. I you know I did mention the he died on the cross and he bodily rose from the grave three yes. days later. Okay, you did. The, that. the word became flesh. That is the virgin birth. Oh, but see now you're you're asking that we assume certain things based upon your past teachings that 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 just was, was see what's good for the goose is good for the gander and i'll always share that when is that, when communicating is, that, is the word became flesh that's the virgin birth i i didn't read the virgin birth that's what i'm saying is we could no, overanalyze what, I'm, what we i'm could, saying is no we, we there's could, no there's no call tim uh in the gospel that you have to understand the doctrine of the trinity I'll just leave that there. I'll just leave that there. There's the call to repentance and to turn from Islam, to turn from a pedophile prophet, to turn from a satanically inspired Quran. That's not language he's going to use <laughs> there. Although well, it's true, that's language he saying, wouldn't use. What I'm saying is, is if a man is worth his salt. Okay, then he goes off onto his story. And this, this is really what these, this is really what he's about. Um, he re this is this is really the the mindset. The mindset is to get that shot in there. Got to talk about repenting from Islam, even though you know the Gospel of John doesn't actually use the term repent. But see that standard. See how many times we've caught him utilizing that double standard. Um, it's all through. I only have one other block that I marked off. Let, I might as well go ahead and listen to it real quick, and then we're done. If you're in a mosque and you have a very powerful imam and at the end of the night they're applauding you and you're tying bow ties on him and having a gay old time doing so and you think you've preached the gospel, Jim will say that. No, I, I share the gospel. You share the gospel in a mosque? Listen, we have to be clear on not only what we're calling people to but what we're calling them from. Now. Let's finish up with this. Um, Steve says he's listened to the re these responses. So, Steve, I, I want to ask you. Um, you'll never get that opportunity to do that. But if for some strange reason you had. Um, what would be the chances? If you had presented, if you had said, I call all of you to leave your satanic religion and your pedophile prophet and believe in Jesus, do you think that you would ever had the conversation with the young lady afterwards that I had? You know, the conversation where she thanks me for coming, found it very educational, very useful, but asked me a question. Um, how do I deal with the influence of pagan religion on the development of the doctrine of the Trinity at the Council of Nicaea? Do you think anybody would have asked you about that with an open mind if you had spoken like that in the mosque? So in other words, Steve, what I'm asking is, why can't you trust the Holy Spirit of God to apply his truth in people's lives and bring them to come to understand these things without you having to use razor blades to their face? Seriously, this is how you do it. Razor blades to the face.
you know, some people will say, well, you know, you're saying this now about Islam, but, uh, you know, you, you signed the Nashville Statement. That's the same thing. No, it's not. Nashville Statement is not satanic religion, pedophile prophet. The Nashville Statement is biblical, firm, clear, but there are no razors to the face in the Nashville Statement. And um, may I point you to my debate that J.D. Hall introduced (laughs) Um, with the author of Torn for a clear example of a pastorally sensitive, uncompromising discussion of human sexuality? Sorry, there is no parallel. Again, um, I will allow... Pastor Camp to answer for his motivations, I I cannot discern them. They are uh, beyond discerning. Um, But I think we've demonstrated just going to this point um, just how bankrupt this continued uh, exhortation. And you say, why, why do you keep dealing with it? Aside from the fact that the the arguments are morphing and the claims are morphing. What you need to hear is that Steve Camp is saying, don't prepare yourself to be a sharp instrument in the hands of Christ to the Muslim people. That's compromise. And I say to you, it's just the opposite. It's just the opposite. Um, Steve Camp needs to step up his game. First of all, stop misrepresenting the other side. And then secondly, uh, there are certain terms. You know, Steve, you, you love talking about Greek. I don't think you read it, but you love talking about it. And so um, how, about, uh, how about picking up your game? And let's, let's see some meaningful refutation exegetically of what I've presented in regards to the nature of dialogismos. Pytho, uh, Pismene, if you want to use the substitute for it. Um, let's, let's hear something meaningful from you rather than just misrepresentation, a lot of verbiage. A lot of verbiage. So there you go, folks. Um, do I expect a meaningful response? Uh, I'll be honest with you. I, I, I don't, but... To others, yeah, it's, the issue is, what about others? What about the person preparing to go on the mission field? I think there needs to be a rebuttal of people that are saying, hey, you don't need to know what those folks believe. Because they'll take a little bit of truth. God can use anyone to proclaim the gospel. That's true. But if you take that to the length that they're taking it to, that means we should never do ministry preparation. Because you can use anybody. You don't need to learn those biblical languages or all the rest of that kind of stuff, right? No. Balance, consistency, vitally important. All right, folks. Thank you for listening to the program today. Lord willing, we'll see you next time. God bless.